Liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, liebe Freunde des Ambos Studientelegramms, Markus at home welcomes Dr. Ian McDougall in London, UK, and Dr. Hossein Araholi in Chicago, Illinois, with whom we would like to discuss in a pro and con debate whether or not to routinely use IV iron in heart failure patients, particularly with laboratory evidence of iron deficiency. Ian Hossein, it's a privilege to have you tonight. Thanks so much for accepting our invitation. Dr. Ian McDougall is Professor of Clinical Nephrology at King's College London and R&D Lead for the Renal Department at King's as well as the South London Renal Comprehensive Local Research Network Lead for the National Institute of Health Research Network. He has led seminal multicenter clinical trials on anemia, particularly renal anemia, including the pivotal trial that found a high dose or proactive IV iron treatment strategy to be prognostically superior to a low dose or reactive IV iron treatment strategy in dialysis patients. Pivotal followed four large negative trials on erythropoiosis stimulating agents, and it was indeed one of the very few large clinical trials in dialysis that found a prognostic benefit. Dr. Hossein Adaholi is cardiologist and professor of medicine at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine, Chicago, Illinois. He is director of the Feinberg Cardiovascular and Renal Research Institute Center for Molecular Cardiology and the 2021-2022 president of the American Society for Clinical Investigation and deputy editor of the JCI, the Journal of Clinical Investigations. He has published pivotal basic research studies on the benefits and risks of iron on cellular and subcellular levels. And he has written several clinical reviews and editorials that caution against a too broad application of IV iron in heart failure for the time being. Now, heart failure treatment has changed tremendously these last years with very strong evidence from large clinical trials for a prognostic benefit of ACE inhibitors or ANIS, SGLT2 inhibitors, aldosterone antagonists and beta blockers in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and a prognostic benefit at least of SGLT2 inhibitors in HEFPEF. Again, in the field of heart failure, there are emerging data from smaller trials with surrogate markers that suggest at least a symptomatic benefit of IV iron in heart failure patients who have laboratory evidence of iron deficiency, while large phase three studies, which are powered to prove or reject prognostic benefit of IVI in these patients are still ongoing. Against this background, we would like to discuss with two global experts in the field, whether in early autumn 2022, we should routinely give IV iron to heart failure patients, particularly those who have laboratory evidence of iron deficiency. And with this, I leave the microphone to Stefan. Also for me, thank you very much for joining and giving us the opportunity for this discussion. Just very, very briefly, we alluded to it before, we would ask you, if possible, to um, each of you uh, on his own first give a short presentation, about 10 minutes on your point of view, that might be rather pro-discussion from um, uh, Professor McDougall and a rather con controversial contra discussion from Professor Ardaholi. Um, and then we'll switch over uh, doing a sort of rebuttal so everybody gets the chance to answer or comment on the uh, points of his uh, opponent. And in the end, uh, time permitting, we would maybe ask a couple of short questions, uh, Gunnar and myself, and, and to make a, a round uh, story. So I would like, uh, I'd like to ask uh, Professor McDougall, please, to start with uh, your point of view. We're, we're very excited. Um, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, address this very controversial topic of whether interferon sound treatment should routine, routinely be used in patients with heart failure. I'm taking the stance that these, or assumption perhaps, that these patients have iron deficiency, since if there's no iron deficiency, there is no logic in correcting the iron deficiency with intravenous iron. So I'm assuming the patients have heart failure and laboratory evidence of iron deficiency manifest by the criteria used in the increasing number of 
published randomized controlled trials, uh, which is a ferritin less than 100 microgram per litre and or a ferritin of between 100 and 300 microgram per litre in association with the transfer and saturation less than 20%. So that's where I'm coming from and I'd like to present the evidence. Now, with all evidence in clinical practice, we base this on a biological rationale and we um, support this with initially perhaps cellular studies in the laboratory uh, of which uh, Dr. Ardehali has contributed a lot in this field animal models and then we go into human studies starting perhaps with observational data uh, from large uh, data sets which are hypothesis generating but absolutely can't answer the question due to confounding and showing associations rather than uh, being able to prove causality and it's only randomized controlled trials in modern day clinical practice that we can use to uh, determine the appropriate therapy for any uh, aspect of, of clinical medicine, since this is the only uh, mechanism that we can use to um, reduce the confounding and bias that one sees in large observational databases. So just starting with where we're coming from, in recent years, it's become recognised that iron deficiency causes adverse clinical outcomes um, via perhaps two pathways. Now, the old pathway that everybody has known about for decades is the hemopoietic pathway, where iron is critical in the uh, production of red cells. Um, and the absence or, or, or deficiency of iron would lead to anemia and an iron deficiency anemia with pathophysiological effects. But in recent years, we recognize that iron does far more than contribute to red cell production. It's involved in mitochondrial function. It's involved in a number of cellular, critical cellular enzymes uh, used to generate uh, energy and ATP in the uh, cell uh, and also uh, in the um, muscle pigment myoglobin. So, and this just summarizes this in, in another way. So the um, premise of what I'm, uh, going to present to you is that iron is essential for oxygen transport and storage, uh, but also oxidative metabolism in muscle, in addition to its effect on red cells. And that's the, the uh, aspect I'm going to focus on today. Um, and really with this uh, hypothesis that iron deficiency uh, is detrimental in the absence of anemia, as well as the presence of anemia. So just starting with some cellular work, and this is a very uh, nice set of experiments from the Netherlands, from Peter van der Meer's group, uh, where he looked at um, depriving human cardiomyocytes in culture uh, by administering desferioxamine and then repleting the iron again by adding back transferrin bound iron. And this is showing the results of this um, series of experiments in, in one slide. The deprivation of iron is, is in the second uh, panel in, in, the, in, the, in the graphs um, shown in red. And then uh, the transfer and bound iron repletion is shown in the blue. And you can see that contractility is affected by the deprivation of iron uh, in the red there, and it's restored by the um, uh, uh, administration of transferrin bound iron. So that was some laboratory data to say, say that iron deficiency is not good for human cardiomyocytes. And then there's another study from my own institution in King's College London, uh, where um, uh, Dr. Obion Conco and his colleagues used uh, MR spectroscopy to look at skeletal muscle performance now in human uh, patients uh, with heart failure uh, and showing that intravenous iron improved the skeletal muscle performance measured as uh, phosphocreatine kinase against the uh, placebo in a double blind uh, controlled manner. But the majority of the evidence that I wish to present in the last five minutes just is a snapshot of the data from four large randomized controlled trials, uh, four in uh, uh, heart failure and uh, the pivotal study that our chairman's already mentioned, which was 
uh, our study in hemodialysis patients. So starting with the FAIR-HF trial, which is perhaps the most well-known and cited trial in heart failure with intravenous iron published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the highest uh, scientific rigor of a trial being double blind and placebo controlled as it had to be with some of these endpoints. The endpoints were not hard clinical endpoints, but there were endpoints that mattered to the patient, namely the six minute walk test and uh, a number of uh, patient reported outcomes. I'm just showing here the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire. And the critical thing with the intravenous iron, it was ferric carboxymaltose in this study, uh, against placebo was that the benefits in six minute walk test and in the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire were achieved at four weeks, which is before there was any appreciable change in hemoglobin, again suggesting that these effects were due to a, perhaps a direct effect on skeletal or cardiac muscle energetic, energetics uh, rather than via red cells. Um, and indeed, when the um, presence or absence of anemia was analysed with regard to these outcomes, the uh, p-value for interaction was negative, suggesting that these improvements occurred in the absence of any correction of anemia. Um, there were many sceptics following the publication of this trial, so another trial was uh, uh, set up to uh, confirm these data or refute them. Uh, this time, the primary endpoint was a six minute uh, walking distance at week 24. Uh, but the follow up here was longer, going out to uh, a year, but the primary endpoint was measured at week 24. Again, in fact, carboxymaltose versus placebo, double blind placebo controlled. And, and in contrast to placebo, the intravenous ion improved the walking distance by 33 meters um, with a standard error of, of 11 meters. So that another positive outcome uh, heart failure study with intravenous ion. And one of the secondary analyses in this uh, study, which is a very important one, was the hospitalization rate, which was dramatically reduced uh, the time to first hospitalization due to worsening heart failure, was dramatically reduced with a p-value of 0 0.009 uh, for um, uh, intravenous um, ferric carboxymaltose versus uh, placebo. Uh, the next study was the EFFECT HF study. It was a much smaller study, but again, randomized and controlled. Uh, again, fair inject versus standard care in patients with heart failure of reduced ejection fraction and iron deficiency. This time, the endpoint was the change in peak VO2 uh, at 24 weeks, and again, this was statistically significant against placebo in favor of the intravenous iron. And the last heart failure study was uh, the more recently published one, which is the firm HF study published in the Lancet. Primary endpoint for this study was total heart failure hospitalizations and cardiovascular death, and uh, this was reduced by 21% uh, with a rate ratio of 0.79. Um, for the primary endpoint and for hospitalizations, uh, there's a 26% reduction with a p-value of 0 0.013 for ferric carboxymaltose against placebo, again, in a blinded fashion. And then the last trial I just wish to present is the one that's um, close to nephrologist heart, me being a, a nephrologist. And this was our study conducted in the UK with across 50 sites, recruiting over 2,000 patients uh, and randomizing uh, 2,141 to either a, a quite an aggressive approach to intravenous iron in hemodialysis patients uh, in a proactive fashion um, against a very cautious low dose reactive protocol in the other thousand patients in the trial. And so the patients in the reactive high dose IV iron uh, were given uh, as per protocol uh, almost double the amount of intravenous iron compared to the reactive low dose group. And this was set up as a safety study uh, to really test if there uh, is a non inferiority analysis, uh, testing the hypothesis that giving lots of intravenous iron would not be harmful to hemodialysis patients. And we met non inferiority with a p value of 0 0.001 for the primary endpoint 
of death, myocardial infarction, stroke, or hospitalization for heart failure. And that allowed us under the pre-specified statistical analysis to conduct a superiority analysis. And indeed that was positive with a borderline but positive p-value of 0 0.04 in favor of a, an aggressive approach to intravenous iron against a very cautious uh, approach to uh, intravenous iron. And this is my last slide of data. I'm just showing the components of the primary endpoint. Uh, all cause death was almost significant in favor of the high dose iron. Stroke was neutral. Uh, there was a 31% reduction in fatal or non fatal myocardial infarction in favor of intravenous, uh, aggressive intravenous iron, and a 34% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure. And these were uh, adjudicated by a blinded. Uh, endpoint adjudication committee. So we're also seeing a reduction in heart failure in our hemodialysis population by giving aggressive amounts of intravenous iron versus uh, a, a standard of care cautious approach to intravenous iron. So I'm concluding really by suggesting to you that all the randomized controlled trials of intravenous iron published to date have yielded positive outcomes uh, with different primary endpoints, of course, but they've all been positive in favor of intravenous iron. And in particular, there is no evidence of harm in these randomized control trials, which uh, have been set up looking for harm. Pivotal was designed specifically to see if there was harm by giving a lot of iron to hemodialysis patients and the opposite outcome was achieved. So we have seen positive outcomes for intravenous iron, different intravenous ions in these study, in Pivotal, it was iron sucrose. In the other studies, it was ferric carboxymaltose. Um, now, of course, that begs the question of whether the same could be achieved with oral iron. Uh, why does it have to be intravenous? Well, it might be that oral iron could work. The evidence in favor of oral iron is only really from the iron out heart failure trial, which was negative. And there may be some reasons why this trial was negative. But that's all we've got to go on so far. So in terms of the outcomes of the change in VO2 ma uh, max, the change in the six minute walk test, the change in NT bro PNB, and the change in the Kansas City cardiomyopathy questionnaire, all negative. All the p-values were negative for oral iron uh, in, in this particular trial. So I'm suggesting to you that the evidence is strong for giving intravenous iron to patients with heart failure, with reduced ejection fraction and iron deficiency, uh, until we've got any evidence to suggest the contrary, and there are indeed other heart failure trials ongoing. So we'll look forward to them with interest. The Iron Man study in particular will hopefully report later this year. And that study is completed and is uh, about to be submitted for publication, but I, uh, we can't discuss results uh, today. But I think the evidence of what we have today is overwhelmingly positive in favor of giving intravenous iron to patients with heart failure and iron deficiency, and I rest my case. Thank you. Well, thank you, um, Ian. Well, we could go straight to the uh, following um, contra response, maybe, of um... Professor Arda Hawley. Thank you for having me. We are uh, in the city of Chicago. I'm in the city of Chicago. We have a beautiful, beautiful day here in Chicago. I'm actually, my office, I can see Lake Michigan and uh, it's a beautiful day. And there are a lot of boats on the, on the lake with people having fun. So, you know, on a day like this, you always wonder what, what am I doing in my office? But anyways, let's have this discussion. I'm really excited to have this discussion. So basically, I just want to start by uh, telling you about the definition of iron deficiency. And it's very important to understand that unlike many other nutrients, iron deficiency has to be defined or is defined uh, in uh, two different terms. The, the first one is absolute iron deficiency. And that basically represents the depletion of total iron stores in the body because of uh, abnormal absorption of iron or because of GI bleeding or some other factors. But in addition to that, we also have functional iron deficiency, and that's because of inadequate iron mobilization. This is a very complicated uh, uh, process. We don't know exactly all the uh, details involved, but usually under you know, the chronic conditions, especially when you have uh, an infection, there is hepcidin production, 
And because of that, there is less absorption of iron in the GI system, and that causes uh, iron trapping in macrophages. Even though we have enough iron in our body, we cannot mobilize the iron in, from macrophages to other tissue. And uh, it's very important that in many chronic diseases that are associated with functional ID, hepcidine is actually significantly increased. But in heart failure patients, and this is the study that actually comes from uh, Piotr Ponikowski's group, I believe uh, both Ian and, and I, we were both uh, included as authors on that paper. I'm not I'm sure about that, but serum levels of hepcidin is actually diminished in heart failure patients. It's not increased like what we see in cancer, in chronic infection, and in diseases that are associated with functional iron deficiency. So it's very important to understand that the uh, criteria that are used for iron deficiency, sometimes they, they you know, people use uh, uh, looser criteria because of functional iron deficiency, but that doesn't really apply to a heart failure because it's not associated with an increase in hepcidin level, which is usually associated with a significant chronic inflammatory process, which could happen in heart failure, but it's not really that significant to cause an increase in hepcidin production. So what are the criteria for iron deficiency? We have the heart failure guidelines, and this is basically seroferritin levels less than 100, and uh, or if it is between 100 and 300, T set of less than 20%. So this is what is used to define functional iron deficiency is used in chronic kidney disease, which I agree with. But what we have here, this was again, uh, originally used in patients with chronic kidney disease and then later adopted, and I believe incorrectly in studies of ID in heart failure. And this is an area that I'm gonna focus on that these criteria are incorrect to apply to patients with heart failure. One other thing I want to mention is that if you look at bone marrow studies, serum ferritin levels less than 15 is highly specific for absolute iron deficiency. And again, remember, ferritin is an acute, acute phase reactant, and the true cutoff is not really clear. So this idea of ferritin less than 100 or between 100 and 300 to define iron deficiency in heart failure is not based on science. And it's gonna include a lot of patients who are not truly iron deficient. And I'm actually gonna uh, talk about that in more detail in my talk. So Ian uh, very nicely talked about epidemiological studies, clinical uh, trials, and basic science data to study the, uh, to look at the overall or totality of evidence for use of, use of IV iron in heart failure. So I'm gonna go over some of them in detail, uh, in, uh, you know, quickly. So what do we know about epidemiological studies? I'm just listing some of those studies. There's significant, significant correlation between iron stores and iron load and cardiovascular mortality that has been shown before. There is low prevalence of chronic or uh, coronary heart disease in areas where there is high prevalence of iron deficiency. High serum ferritin is associated with risk factors for coronary heart disease. Association between serum iron and risk of fatal acute MI has been shown. Ferritin is one of the strongest indicators and predictors of carotid, carotid artery disease. And blood donors have reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. And I'm a firm believer in that. I, I was doing so much blood donation uh, for a long time that uh, I became iron deficient. My ferritin went down to 11. Uh, which is uh, very low, and I was having a restless leg syndrome. It got to that point, uh, and uh, uh, and I for a while I took uh, iron supplementation because I'm a firm believer that blood donation is actually good for you. And uh, increased hematocrit is associated with an increased risk of cardiovascular mortality. So Ian uh, very nicely went over these studies. I'm not going to go over details. So the uh, three major uh, studies that have been published before are per heart failure, confirmed heart failure, and effect heart failure. Um, uh, I'm not gonna go over details here, but let me talk about limitations. You know, we didn't talk about limitations. We talked about what the studies showed that I've listed here and uh, it has already been discussed. So let me talk about the limitations of these studies. First of all, per heart failure, the majority were white, stable, ambulatory heart failure patients. There was a short follow-up of 24 weeks and the endpoints were subjective, uh, subjective and not outcome. Confirmed heart fa failure, uh, was the benefit was more significant in patients with diabetes and chronic kidney disease. And we know patients with chronic kidney disease benefit from, uh, from iron therapy. 
And uh, 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 one thing that we, we, sh we should really consider in effect heart failure, a value of zero was assigned to the peak uh, VO2 for pa two patients who died. So if you take those two zeros out, there is no difference in peak VO2. So that basically the p-value goes to 0 0.23. So this was not actually a positive study. And despite an increase in one gram per deciliter in hemoglobin in patients with the, in the FCM group, the peak VO2 remained unchanged. So again, even with these studies, the question is whether or not these patients who are defined in this category of ferritin less than 100 uh, or ferritin between 100 and 300 and TSAT of 20 should get uh, 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 IBRN. Uh, a firm heart failure came out last year, or I believe a year and a half ago, and this was published in Lancet. It basically looked at the effects of IBRN therapy on hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular disease. It didn't meet its primary endpoint. It got uh, close to, to 0 0.05, but there was a significant reduction in heart failure hospitalization in the IBRN uh, group, and the benefits were more pronounced, and this is very important, they didn't do a sub-analysis of ferritins uh, uh, in different categories when it is less than 100. But those patients who were in 100 to 300, the benefit was not uh, uh, as pronounced as it was for ferritin less than 100. Again, I would have loved to see what the ferritin, if there was a stepwise improvement in hospitalization for ferritin, lower ferritin compared to ferritins in the like 70 to 100 uh, 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 you know, uh, range, but that wasn't included in this study. All right, I'm going to skip that, but I just also want to emphasize that the FDA label or food drug, uh, U.S. Food and Drug Administration label for IV iron, this is for uh, uh, inject uh, for one of the forms, but it is it applies to all of the IV forms of iron, the label says that IV iron should be given to patients who have uh, uh, not intolerance of oral iron or have uh, had unsatisfactory response to oral iron or who have non-dialysis dependent chronic kidney disease. This practice we are doing of giving IV iron without giving oral iron a chance is off label, off FDA label. label. It is not approved by the FDA. And that's one thing I wanna emphasize here. Now, why is it important to consider PO iron? This is the mechanism of how iron is absorbed in our digestive tract. I'm not gonna go over details here. It's a little complicated, but the bottom line is that if you are not iron deficient, you are not gonna absorb iron in your digestive tract. There is no way because uh, the liver produces this protein called hepcidin and it will prevent iron absorption in the digestive tract. No matter what you do, you will not absorb iron because you're going to get iron overloaded. Our body has learned how to deal with our you know, iron levels. If you don't need it, the digestive tract is not going to absorb iron. And that's really important to realize, to understand that if you if you are giving you know, pure iron to patients who are not iron deficient, you are not going to increase their iron indices because they're not going to absorb it. So let's talk about PO versus iron, iron, IV iron in heart failure. There was one study that was uh, started, it was called iron HF, but it was terminated uh, early because of uh, they didn't have enough funding, uh, but uh, uh, both treatment groups showed significant increase in ferritin and TSAT and oral, oral iron was also uh, showed increased ferritin levels. There is another. There was another study where treatment uh, with oral iron uh, was showed there was a significant increase in serum iron, ferritin, and TSAT and hemoglobin. We all know about iron out heart failure uh, study, which was published a few years ago in JAMA. And uh, Ian already talked about it. It was 225 heart failure patients who got uh, iron uh, polysaccharide at 150 milligram twice a day. The peak VO2 did not change in both groups. Oral iron increased TSAT by only 3.3% and ferritin by 11.3%. And patients, this is very important. So what they did in the, in the paper, they looked at patients who had lower serum hepcidin. And those patients actually showed more, more pronounced increments in TSAT and ferritin. Those are patients who are truly iron deficient. They are gonna absorb iron that goes into their, into their, into their digestive tract. Patients who are not iron deficient are not gonna absorb iron. And again, this goes back to this criteria we are using. 
to identify patients who are iron deficient in, in heart failure. And many of these patients are not truly iron deficient. So they are not gonna absorb iron in their digestive tract. So these are the limitations. I already talked about it, but the IV iron has not been shown to increase PBO, uh, peak VO2 in heart failure either. This wasn't a uh, direct comparison between IV and PO iron. And again, the majority of uh, patients in this study didn't need iron. And uh, 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 heart failure patients with low serum hepcidin level responded better to uh, oral iron supplementation. And again, pure iron may require longer duration for treatment because the absorption may take longer uh, to correct the uh, deficiency of iron. Now, in, in terms of pure iron, there was a recent study that showed three month uh, therapy with low dose uh, uh, iron in ID and uh, patients with heart failure led to higher iron indices and improved exercise at three and six months. So we do have studies in with pure iron, uh, pure iron in patients with heart failure, and it has shown to improve uh, outcome. And there is a study that is going on right now. This is a great study. I'm really glad somebody is finally doing this study where they're comparing IV to oral iron, and they're gonna look at functional capacity in patients with uh, ID or iron deficiency and uh, uh, heart failure. Uh, there are three studies going on right now. Uh, iron, uh, they were supposed to come out a, few, a couple of years ago, but it looks like, and I checked last night, they were still on the clinical uh, trials.gov. Uh, iron Man apparently is gonna come out late, later this year. I'm gonna skip this uh, for now. Uh, pivotal trial was very nicely done by, uh, by uh, uh, Dr. McDougall. Uh, uh, and I just wanna mention uh, that uh, the, the fact that a higher iron didn't show uh, or showed superiority. One other thing I wanna mention is that the IV iron use was associated with less erythropoietin use in these patients. And I would like to make sure I'm saying this correctly. So I, uh, in the debate uh, or in the discussion section, if I'm wrong, please correct me. But we know that erythropoietin is associated with worse outcomes. So it doesn't surprise me that when you use less erythropoietin, you actually show benefit. Is it because of iron? Could be, but there was there is another factor here, which is less erythropoietin use in patients who got higher iron uh, levels. The other thing I, you know, this was mentioned earlier, we have tried so much to correct uh, anemia and iron deficiency and all, everything has failed. And whether or not IV iron is beneficial in patients, you know, we have used, uh, we have tried to give uh, uh, red blood cells, we have been trying to give uh, erith uh, erythropoietin to our patients, whether or not IV iron is beneficial, and the fact that we are trying to correct something that there is no evidence that is actually beneficial by targeting this, you know, the, the hemoglobin uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, or uh, overall, uh, the level, the, you know, the overall levels of hemoglobin targeting it from different angles, nothing has worked. And now we are going after IV iron. Whether or not it works, we need safety, we need long-term safety, and we need long-term uh, you know, uh, efficacy trials before we can make a conclusion. And in addition to that, we have evidence that chelator ther chelation therapy is actually beneficial in patients who have coronary disease. This study was called a TAC trial. When it came out, people didn't believe it because it was so positive. It was with a chelation, uh, uh, ther it was chelation therapy with the EDTA, and there was 41% overall reduction, reduction in the risk of cardiovascular events in patients who had diabetes or patients who had previous uh, evidence of coronary artery disease. So there was a significant reduction and uh, everybody was so surprised that the NIH, and again, this is this unlike previous studies that I showed you, this is a study that was sponsored by the NIH, not by, uh, by any drug company. And this was, uh, the NIH was so impressed that they have funded a second study called TAC2. So TAC2 is going on right now, and I believe it will come out in the next uh, uh, year or two. So side effects of IV iron should not be ignored. We know that iron, when you inject it into your, uh, into your uh, vessels, it can cause oxidative damage to, 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 the, uh, to, the, uh, you know, to the endothelial cells. And uh, the form that we are using now is less oxidative, but it doesn't take away the potential oxidative effect on the endothelial cells of IV iron. We know how to absorb iron. The iron that goes into our digestive tract is transported in our body by binding to transparent. It's not, it, you know, it, it's in a form that doesn't cause damage to our, to our vessels. 
over you know so many years of evolution, we have learned to take away the toxic effects of iron by digesting it into into our uh, uh, in in you know, in our digestive system and taking it attached to a protein. For the first time in in evolution, uh, we are seeing iron being injected into into our into our vessels, and this is not what nature is prepared for. Giving this oxidative molecule in our in our circulation without taking the you know potential side effects of of this, I heard uh, uh, ten days ago when I was Germany that there is evidence uh, from registry 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 data that there is an increased incidence of cancer. This hasn't been published yet yet, but it, there may, this may actually. Uh, 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 be published sometime soon. I mentioned that there is an increased oxidative stress. And also uh, there was a uh, randomized cl clinical trial of uh, uh, IV iron versus oral iron in chronic kidney disease that had to be terminated early because of cardiovascular side effects. So this should be taken into consideration. And finally, osteomalacia, which appears to be specific to FCM, and this appears to be through FGF23, this is a real thing. This happens to patients and this is really hard to fix. So that's something that should be taken into consideration. So we published a paper a couple of months ago and we argued that optimization of heart failure treatment by itself may improve oral iron absorption. There was a study where 30% of heart failure patients over a period of one year, they were shown to develop ID or iron deficiency, but 50% of them, they had resolution of their ID without any intervention. So iron may actually fluctuate as a physiological response to heart failure and transient ID in heart failure may be just a marker of poor heart failure clinical status and not a cause of heart failure mortality. And persistent ID should be treated, but a little bit of decrease in ID should not, uh, does not require treatment. Unfortunately, you know, uh, the Europeans have been uh, giving this uh, treatment and they specifically mention FCM. Who, uh, which is uh, sponsored by a, a pharma company. Uh, they give, a, give it a 2A, uh, class 2A with level A indication, which is quite surprising to me to see this kind of uh, uh, recommendation coming from uh, a cardiology uh, group. Uh, but the uh, recommendation uh, for uh, uh, ACC AHH 2B and uh, the level is uh, uh, level of evidence is given BR, not A, which is, uh, I believe it is more appropriate. So what do we know so far? Let me just summarize what we know. Ferritin less than 15 defines iron deficiency. This is what we know. If you want to know if you're iron deficient, if you don't want to get a bone marrow uh, biopsy, you can measure ferritin. If it is less than 15, you have iron deficiency. My ferritin was 11. Uh, so I, I had iron deficiency. Many patients with uh, in IV iron trials did not need iron. And that's the problem. And that's the argument I've been making that this criteria we are using, we are identifying patients who are not iron deficient. We are putting a potentially toxic molecule in their, in their circulation. And we don't worry about potential side effects. We don't have enough clinical trials. We don't have enough efficacy trials. And we are just, you know, we are uh, uh, being uh, advocating for this kind of therapy. Giving IV iron before a trial of uh, uh, oral iron is FDA, not, not FDA approved, is off-label use of iron. IV iron is expensive. And again, I've mentioned it has major side effects. Little evidence that IV iron improves outcomes in heart failure, but has benefit over, uh, or has any benefit over PO iron. And aggressively marketing of IV iron by the pharma industry, I've seen it all, I've seen it a lot. And uh, many of us have seen it before too. So the thing is that, of course, you know, the uh, number of patients have to increase to get, uh, to, to have, uh, you know, uh, financial, uh, uh, to have financial incentive to promote a drug. And if we have looser criteria and include patients who are not iron deficient, the drug will be used more uh, uh, by, by physicians. And that's the problem that I, I believe has to change. We cannot use this loose criteria that is not based on science. So what is our view? Our, views, uh, our view is that only patients with ID should be treated with iron. I'm a, I'm a firm believer that if you are iron deficient, you should get iron therapy. I had iron deficiency myself and I took iron. If there is a 24 year old woman who has iron deficiency, she should get iron. They're gonna feel better. I felt better. My you know, restless leg syndrome went away. 
but they have to be, these patients should be truly iron deficient, not patients who are not, you know, who are just put into this category without evidence that they are iron deficiency, iron deficiency. And then evidence suggests symptomatic relief, outcome data are limited. Pure iron should be tried first. And I can, you know, based on all the basic science work we have done, I can, I'm confident if you are iron deficient, no matter if you have, uh, if you have heart failure or if you don't have heart failure, you are going to absorb the iron in your digest digestive tract. This is how our body works. There is no way hepcidin would be increased. We know that hepcidin is not increased. So your, your digestive tract would absorb iron in, your, in the digestive tract. It will work in patients with heart failure. And IV iron has significant side effects and it's expensive. And use of IV iron in heart failure without a trial of PO is off label. So that's our view. Now, the last uh, couple of slides, I think this is my last uh, uh, slide. I wanna mention this thing about nutrient deficiency. We have been saying to our patients that less is more. You know, don't eat too much, it's not good for you. Don't eat too much carbohydrates, don't eat too much fat. We think that, you know, their nutrient deficiency is not a bad thing. And, uh, and over, you know, we have been dealing with iron deficiency for 4 billion years, more than dealing with oxygen deficiency. We know how to deal with iron uh, oxygen deficiency in our body, but iron deficiency is something we have learned for, for 4 billion years. And we have worked extensively in our lab to understand how our cells respond to iron deficiency in the, in the environment. And we have great, you know, very interesting data how our body responds to iron deficiency in the environment. So we don't need to worry about uh, nutrient deficiency and uh, have, have, we don't have to inject this potentially toxic molecule into the veins of our patients. They will absorb. If they are iron deficient, deficient they are gonna get in, into their body. Fats and caloric restriction, they have all, all have health benefit. And, uh, and I'm, you know, we, we believe that the, the iron deficiency is also something that we know how to deal with. And there is a sophisticated system in place to protect our organs against iron deficiency. And that's, you know, that's something we have published over so many papers over the past few years, uh, identifying this pathway that is in place to protect our organs. Now I'm going to finish with another story that remind that reminds me of this story with iron deficiency, and that's the what we know about testosterone. So for a long time, you know, these pharma companies they said, well, if your testosterone is low, you should get testosterone replacement therapy, which doesn't make any sense. Our testosterone goes down as we age, and basic scientists for a long time said this is a mitogen. Be careful, don't don't uh, use this drug. And you know, I see a lot of patients who come to my practice who are on, uh, you know, testosterone replacement therapy. So basic science has value. There is, there is, you know, they, it can guide our clinical practice. And there were epidemiological and a, a, a clinical studies that also just a benefit with testosterone. And uh, again, basic scientists were warning about the potential mitogenic effects of testosterone. And finally, several studies came out and they showed increased risk of cardiovascular uh, risk in older men. And now many of these testosterone uh, drugs have uh, a black box warning uh, because of their effect on blood pressure and also on cardiovascular risk. So I hope I didn't go too uh, far, uh, you know, didn't go beyond my time limit. So I apologize if I did. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, um, Hussein. We would like to stay with our. Uh, schedule and and uh, give uh, Professor McDougall uh, the opportunity to respond to to some issues um, as he likes. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I, I have to say that yesterday I looked at my slide deck and I thought I'm never going to get through all these slides in 10 minutes. So I cut out 15 slides from my slide deck because I thought this is going to go over 15, 20 minutes. And I thought, to be fair, this, you know, this has, if this was an Oxford adjudicated debate, I would be absolutely crucified for going over 10 minutes, as would be my, uh, my uh, sparring partner. Uh, in Germany, clearly, maybe things are more liberal and, and you can do this, but I, I, I feel I've not had the same opportunity to present my case as Dr. Adi Halley has, because a lot of the evidence that I have, I've deleted 
and just kept it as high level. So the first thing I would say is I feel a little bit agree. But anyway, there we go. Maybe I can get more time to talk in the rebuttal than Dr. Ardi Halley. I'm not sure, if, but anyway, the, uh, the, I, I'm going to. There's a lot I could comment on, and I've only got five minutes, so I'm going to have to be brief. The it's a shame we can't just draw up some of Dr. Ardi Halley's slides again, but I'm just going to quote some of what he's said. So he has said that, um, that uh, oral iron and heart failure should work. And that's one of his slides. He said it should work. That is because there's no evidence that it works. Uh, it's just if we base clinical medicine on a product or a drug that should work, then we would be going back to, uh, centuries in terms of, of clinical practice. So I, I think Dr. Adi Halley is right. I think oral iron could work. Uh, it's just there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that it works for heart failure and iron deficiency. There's not one single outcome study. Uh, and I'll ask Dr. Adi Halley to comment. I, I thought he had the opportunity to present uh, data that showed hard outcome uh, improvement with oral iron, of which there is none. So I, I think it should work, and I agree that it could work, but there's no evidence. And I uh, think the evidence for intravenous iron is overwhelming that it works. And I agree with a lot of what Arda Halley has said. I think he's absolutely right. We do not know the cutoffs for iron deficiency in heart failure. I, I believe we don't even know the cutoffs for iron deficiency in CKD, uh, which is how we started this game, as Dr. Arde Halley said at the, the beginning of his talk. I don't believe we've got the right um, iron deficiency parameters for iron deficiency, even in CKD, but you've got to start somewhere. And the evidence is that if you take patients with this ferritin of 100 or the 100 to 300 ferritin with the low TSAT, that intravenous iron improves outcomes. Whether that's the criteria for iron deficiency or not, what we do know is that patients with that criteria have better outcomes. That is overwhelming in the studies that uh, both of us have presented. In fact, we've looked at the same evidence base. Um, Dr. Adi Halley highlighted quite a number of limitations of the studies that I presented, and I agree with a lot of the limitations. Um, he's slightly cherry-picked the data, I mean, absolutely right in saying a firm HF didn't quite meet its primary endpoint with a p-value of just over 0 0.05. It didn't mention the sensitivity analysis for COVID-19, which then took the p-value for the primary endpoint less than 0 0.05, which, you know, is, you could argue is a sensitivity analysis, but it's showing the impact of COVID in, in uh, making a trial very difficult. And I can tell you also that the same uh, uh, limitations are going to be present with all the other heart failure trials when they're reported, including Iron Man, because COVID came along at a time that compromised the, 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 the quality of clinical trials. So FirmHF was the first to be um, uh, stunned by this uh, pandemic, uh, but this, the, the pre-specified COVID sensitivity analysis did show uh, if uh, the, the primary outcome was positive in for Firm HF. So I regard a Firm HF as a positive trial. Dr. Audi Halley maybe thinks it's a negative trial, but I, I think the evidence is, is pretty persuasive for a Firm HF, and it's also concordant with all the other clinical trials. He highlighted the limitations of Effect HF. I was in the steering committee of the Effect HF trial. I absolutely know the problems that we had. I also know the problems that we had measuring peak VO2 in all these different centers with the difference of trying to keep the measurement concordant between multiple centers. It was very difficult. And I think the Effect HF trial was a difficult trial to do. And I completely accept Dr. Ardi Halley's comment about the deaths in the trial affecting the, the result. That is absolutely correct. And it's, it's, it's stated in the circulation paper. But I think Effect HF is the weakest of all the heart failure trials. Uh, so I wouldn't want to base clinical practice just on that. And then I've got lots of other comments, but I think I'm going to have to shut up in a minute because I'm conscious of the fact we should stick to time. Uh, this comment that the FDA have not allowed intravenous iron in heart failure with all due respect to the FDA, and I have been massive respect for the FDA, I've been in Washington several times, uh, I think it's a fantastic regulatory organization, I, I, I think it's top rate, but I think they've got it wrong with intravenous iron, I'm sorry, 
I do not agree with the FDA's adjudication of IVR and heart failure at all. I think they haven't looked at the evidence properly. Uh, I think that the guidelines groups in America and Europe have, and they have uh, adjudged that there is a case for intravenous iron in heart failure and iron deficiency. So the question is, do you base your clinical practice on clinical practice guidelines, which are evidence-based guidelines, or do you base it on regulatory authorities' views of drugs? Now, I think there are multiple examples of where the FDA and the EMA, not just the FDA, but the European Medicines Agency too, have got it wrong for uh, uh, adjudicating uh, therapies. They look at safety primarily and they are incredibly safety driven. Uh, but I don't think they uh, look at the totality of the evidence the way that guidelines groups do. So I, I know that the FDA don't say that you can give IVR in heart failure. That to me doesn't mean that IVM doesn't work in heart failure. I think that's a weak argument. I think uh, quoting FDA evidence rather than clinical trial uh, evidence and guideline evidence, which is what I'm presenting, uh, I think uh, uh, trump the uh, FDA's adjudication on IVM and heart failure. I've got lots more that I could say in response to Dr. Adahali's presentation. There were other bits of it I wasn't very comfortable with either, but I think I'm going to have to shut up now because I think I've had my five minutes. Thank you. Thank you for sticking to the time. Um, Dr. Ardehali, maybe you can also shortly comment again. Yes, well, thank you again. I apologize if I went over uh, my time and uh, thank you Ian for your patience. Um, so uh, in response to PO iron should, should work that I said, I have clinical evidence for it and that's iron uh, out heart failure. Iron out heart failure showed patients who had low hep siding, their uh, iron indices went up. And uh, there was no difference in VO2 max, and there is no evidence that IV iron increases VO2 max. You know, there is, you know, effect heart failure was not a positive study. So I have evidence, I have clinical evidence that pure iron works in patients with heart failure, and that's basically iron out heart failure. We, again, we are looking at, the, we are doing a sub analysis, but that's the exact point I'm making that some of these patients are not iron deficient and they are not gonna absorb iron because our body is not built in a way to absorb iron if you're not iron deficient. So, so again, I believe I, there is clinical evidence to support it. And then um, uh, again, I'll, uh, I'll be brief. I agree with uh, most of the things that uh, Ian mentioned, uh, uh, clinical trials versus FDA. FDA takes a lot of things into consideration, a lot of us in um, you know, the, a lot of investigators who work on iron, we don't feel comfortable with the data that is out there to recommend IV iron in patients with heart failure. I personally don't. And I really believe that un until a study is done, comparing IV iron versus PO iron, we cannot, uh, we cannot promote IV iron in patients with heart failure. It, especially when you look at the guidelines from European society, and it says FCM should be used in these patients. There is absolutely no evidence, and it gives it, uh, you know, evidence le level A. Iron out heart failure. Iron out. I don't believe it is again. I can't remember the details, but I don't think that it is PO versus IV iron. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But unless that study is done, I'm going to give PO iron to my patients. I think it's safe. It is bi bi physiological, and there, I have clinical evidence that it's going to be absorbed. And there is biological evidence. There is all kinds of evidence that they're going to be absorbing it. We know this is a paper that was published. And again, I am confident that both of us were on that paper that hep siding is actually reduced in patients with heart failure. So there is no reason why they wouldn't absorb uh, iron uh, because, of the, because of their heart failure. I'm going to stop there because I went over time with, uh, you know, with my presentation. Uh, but I've really enjoyed this discussion. And I want to thank the moderators and also especially Ian for, for a very uh, uh, fruitful and, uh, and uh, uh, you know, lively discussion. Well, thank you to the both, both of you. I think this, this was uh, overwhelming uh, points of view and, and evidence from both sides, really, and, and leaving everybody to maybe make, make up his or her own mind. If we might be allowed to ask very few additional questions, Gunnar, do you have anything uh, pressing that we need to add to yeah this. maybe two questions to each of you and then one question to both of you so the first question what was not mentioned was pill count because surely 
ENME as nephrologist, we have patients who are to take 20 or 25 or whatsoever pills a day. And I believe that this may be a further argument when it comes to IV iron. So I would be interested in uh, uh, learning what Dr. Arholi thinks about pill count, whether or not this may be an argument for early uh, use of IV iron. And truly because if you give two pills of iron, it, in addition to all the other medication, then patients may not take those medications with, which may affect their prognosis. Yeah, so again, uh, polypharm, uh, poly pills, uh, or you know, the, having too many pills is is an issue with with our patients. We know that, but uh, that doesn't mean that uh, you know we should uh, uh, go to the IV form uh, for a drug for a therapy that could have uh, could potentially have uh, side effects. Um, uh, so I again, I'm I'm not convinced. That there is uh, that this form of therapy is indicated in many of these patients because they are probably they are truly not iron deficient, and also I uh, I believe that the pure iron would work in these patients. They need they don't need to take it forever. You know I took iron myself. Again, you may argue that I'm uh, healthier than most of these uh, heart failure patients, but I took uh, uh, iron pills. I took a form that I didn't tolerate, but then I took a different form for just uh, uh, for uh, a few, few weeks, you know, three, four weeks. And my ferritin went up uh, to 35 and I stopped. I felt like uh, I would get, you know, if I don't donate blood for a while, my uh, ferritin will go up. So the other thing I want to mention is that as I mentioned, mentioned earlier, there is a clinical trial that has shown that ferritin levels fluctuate in these patients. And it may actually be a marker of, their health more than more than what's going on uh, with the, with, the, with their iron levels. Ferritin is an acute phase reactant, and somebody who is sicker, they may have different uh, ferritin levels uh, uh, at different you know time points. So fluctuation of ferritin when it is mildly decreased, that doesn't that doesn't mean it has to be treated. So you know it's I, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Yeah, sorry. So my. Second question to you would be, surely Ironman is under an embargo until November this year, but just imagine Ironman would be positive. Would you still stick to oral iron without evidence, without evidence as far as considered hard endpoint, or would the Ironman data, again, just imagine that it would be positive, then convince you to go for IV iron un unless novel uh, studies on oral iron are available with heart Perfect. and potentially. Yeah, thank you. So that's a good question. So we have to really uh, consider what are we treating here, right? We are treating low iron. So is it is it the only treatment in this patient's IV iron? And I don't believe that. I believe that if you're iron deficient, you're going to absorb iron. So I'm going to put my patients on PO iron, and I believe it works unless they do not tolerate so Iron Man is not is not comparing IV versus pure iron. And unless that study comes out, there is a good study that shows me that pure iron doesn't work in these patients. I'm going to skip, you know, stick with pure iron because I have data from iron out uh, uh, heart failure that it it, it works, and um, um, and I don't have any reason to potentially put this tox toxic molecule in patients' veins when I don't have long term safety data. Uh, uh, with this uh, therapy. And so my first question to Dr. McDougall would be, do you believe that the phosphorus issue is of importance in heart failure? Because I think for us as nephrologists, this is interesting uh, from our pathophysiological understanding, this effect on FGF23. But do you believe that this transient fall in phosphorus may affect our heart failure patients? So, I mean, there are lots that Dr. Adi Halley said that I completely agree with, and I completely agree that there is an issue with ferric carboxymaltase causing hypophosphatemia. There's absolutely no question of that, and it's mediated via FDF23, as you've said. The real question is, what's the clinical impact? Now, I believe in inflammatory bowel disease in young patients with uh, ulcerative colitis that are getting into inside. This could be a major problem. And osteomalacia, which was mentioned in one of uh, Dr. Ari Halley's slides, I think could be a potential problem for this type of patient who's 30, 40 years old. 
Um, in dialysis patients and in heart failure, these patients aren't going to live long. The mortality rate in heart failure and in patients on hemodialysis is huge. It's worse than most cancers. 50% of patients on hemodialysis die within five years. So, I mean, they're not going to have long enough with intravenous to ever develop osteomalacia. They're going to have transient hypophosphatemia with FCM. Maybe you can give other IVM products even that don't cause hypophosphatemia. So we're not talking about specific products here, but if you want to go worst case scenario for this problem with FCM, yes, I think there is an issue with transient hypophosphatemia. What does it actually mean for the patient? Are their pelvises going to fall apart with osteomalacia the way that has been described by in some of the, uh, we have a case reports that suggest this. I believe not. I don't think there's any evidence, unless Dr. Ari Hali can tell me otherwise, of any heart failure patient living long enough to get enough FCM with usually low vitamin D levels to help it on its way to actually develop the bone and metabolic consequences, adverse consequences of FCM. So yes, I think there's a, an issue with transient hypophosphatemia. Does it actually matter in heart failure? I would say the evidence for giving FCM is much uh, in favor of giving it. Uh, I appreciate completely that if the heart failure patient lives for another 40 years, then, then there's a problem. But heart failure patients don't live that long. So my second question, we see quite a lot of patients who have ferritin well above 300, say 400 something, but who have transferrin saturation below 20%. Would you recommend, surely these patients are outside clinical studies, would you recommend to go for iron in these patients? Or would you really consider the ferritin level of 300 as the upper limit? So just can I just clarify the question? Is Are you talking about in hemodialysis patients? Or heart, in, heart failure. In heart failure, heart failure, failure. Sorry. Yeah. So I, I'm not a cardiologist, unlike Dr. Adi Halley, so it's, it's harder for me to comment this. I would suggest the... The evidence base is that you stick to what the evidence base is, which is a ferritin between 100 and 300 and a low TSAT. If you've got a patient with a ferritin of 600 and a TSAT of 16%, they have possibly functional and deficiency, probably driven by an inflammatory state, probably driven by high uh, hepstone levels. Uh, I would suggest that there's no evidence for these patients uh, for giving IVR and heart failure. And I'm, I'm pretty sure Dr. Ardy Halley would agree with that. So I think we're in the same. Uh, I think we're aligned on that one. The problem is the ones that have ferritins less than 100 uh, in heart failure. Uh, as Dr. Ardy Halley said in the firm HF, HF study, these patients did the best of all. And so I would be almost asking Dr. Ardy Halley, if the ferritin is 50 in a heart failure patient, would he still want to try oral iron on the basis of what he thinks it could work? where the evidence in the firm HF is it overwhelmingly does work in terms of the primary endpoints. So I, I think the, the low ferritin ones, where the ferritin's 30 or 20, or let's say 10, uh, I think is, is much more controversial in terms of intravenous iron because Orlan you know, could work in these patients, although I'm not sure there's any evidence certainly in hard outcomes. The evidence for the firm HF strongly suggests there is evidence for hard outcomes for these subsets of patients. So um, yeah, I, I bet to the short answer to your question is a person of 700, I, I don't think should be getting intravenous iron regardless of TSAT. So my last question to both of you. Now we have HIF or HIF stabilizers, at least in nephrology. Do you think this will affect the discussion on iron treatment and heart failure? Or do you believe this uh, HIF stabilizers to, to stay in nephrology? I don't know who who do you want to go first in this. To both, thing? actually. But oh, Doctor Ali can go. Maybe Doctor Ali Halley first, then I can come. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you know there are different ways to modulate iron levels. You can uh, give IV iron or iron chelators. You can also target the uh, transferrin receptor. There are studies in cancer where they're using siRNA or monoclonal antibodies against transferrin receptor one to modulate iron levels inside the tissue. You can target hepcidin ferroportin pa pathway. And now there is a lot of research on targeting this pathway called peroptosis. Uh, 
to, to affect uh, iron levels inside the cells. So one pathway that to target uh, 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 iron is uh, through HIF2 alpha uh, stabilizers. And uh, HIF1 alpha may also have an effect, but HIF2 alpha appears to be the major one that has an effect on, on uh, iron levels. Uh, I don't see any uh, uh, potential uh, therapy for that in heart failure. I think it's a great uh, the therapy in patients with kidney disease, and it may also be used in uh, certain groups of patients with cancer. But in heart failure, again, uh, um, um, uh, targeting HIF to regulate iron levels, I think it's just too extreme because there is so much downstream of HIF. Iron is just one of them. And if you're targeting all these uh, uh, downstream targets, HIP, and you know you stabilize HIP, it may actually be good for the heart. Uh, you know, uh, pay a heart uh, that is in in a fail, you know failed condition. So uh, so you may see benefit, uh, uh, but uh, whether or not it's all through iron, I doubt it. I mean, HIP does so much, and especially in the heart, that uh, it will be really hard to delineate that uh, and see whether or not it's through iron or. Yeah, thanks, Gunnar. So it's nice that we've had a, a debate where we're trying to take opposing actions, and we're going to finish this debate with Dr. Adi Halley and myself both agreeing. So I actually uh, agree completely with uh, what he's saying about, for different reasons, actually, about HIF stabilizers and iron. I've had occasion to review the literature. Uh, it's published this month. I'm just going to have a little salesmanship here with, in current opinion in nephrology and hypertension, I've reviewed all the data for the HIF PHIs in iron metabolism and iron usage. And I can tell you that just the headline for that uh, uh, series of paragraphs in the review is that it does help uh, TIBC levels and it, uh, it has a negative effect on reducing, uh, in, in reducing HIPSTIN uh, as an indirect downstream effect but it does not seem to impact hugely on the need for iron in, in patients, certainly in the long term. So at the, at the present stage, there is no evidence that HIV PHIs are actually helping uh, iron usage and iron requirements in uh, CKD patients, uh, never mind heart failure patients. So I actually think that uh, I, I'm not even sure that HIV PHIs will replace the need for IV iron or even reduce the need for IV iron in a CKD setting, so definitely in heart failure, no. So the, the shorter answer is no, I don't think if PHIs uh, are really going to uh, replace, uh, be, a, be a, um, a new kid in the block for as far as iron status is concerned. Well, thank you so much, the, the two of you. I think there are, I have on my list several other things. We can probably discuss the whole American afternoon and European, European evening further, and uh, we are really, I uh, have been enjoying it, and there's um, uh, tremendous insights from the both of you, from the bo from both the, the, the basic science and the plausibility point of view, and then the clinical evidence point of view. I think this is of a special interest. Um, so, so thank you for this uh, uh, fair discussion and and response to each other. Um, thank you for the time you spent with us. And uh, thank you for all the the evidence you are contributing uh, to the field, and we are very, much looking forward to, to seeing more of that and uh, all have a good rest of the day and a good evening. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.